it would have been a greater pleasure to have met you in person. Professor Yunus's messages, whether it's about job creators versus job seekers, bank for the poor versus bank for the rich, taking the credibility of the bank rather than the people have made him a legend in the fight against poverty. It has also helped facilitate access to capital for disadvantaged sections of the society. The idea behind this multi award winning concept of microcredit is that everyone is an actual entrepreneur. The tipping point was in 2008 when the financial crisis answered one of his questions about the financial credibility of the poor versus the rich. The second tipping point is the current COVID-19 situation, which has proved that entrepreneurship is the way forward. In his book, A World of Three Zeros, Professor Younes is very optimistic about fixing the economy and the environment through zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emission. The current pandemic has deepened unemployment and poverty. And although we see a reduction in carbon emission with complete lockdown, it is not sustainable unless we change our lifestyle drastically. It would be interesting to hear Professor Yunus's thoughts on the same. On a positive note, this current natural pause is a blessing in some ways to help us reboot, reimagine, and restart. Interestingly, Flow Mumbai's mission this year is based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, with a special emphasis on entrepreneurship and environment. The national theme is sustainable livelihood, and we are looking at it across urban, semi-urban, and rural space. We strongly believe that entrepreneurship is the way forward, and we have about 8,000 members, pan-India, most of whom are business and professional women. A collaboration with the UNIS Center is certainly in our wish list. Talking about partnerships, this session was made possible by India Leaders for Social Sector, ILSS, which is part of the Ashoka University. The nine-day program by ILSS that paves the path for corporates to move into the social space is in a league of its own. Anu Prasad, who is the founder, is known for making the impossible possible. As an alumnus of ILSS, I reached out to her to discuss ideas for collaboration. And her suggestion was to invite Professor Yunus for the first session. I was excited, but I wasn't sure it's gonna happen. But within two days, she confirmed that it was all done. So thank you so much and looking forward to a long-term partnership with ILSS. Finally, our moderator, Faye My life gets easy when we have such prominent personalities with us, as most of you know about them. We got a confirmation from Professor Yunus's office. It took us less than a minute to decide that you would be the ideal person for this session. And with fingers and toes crossed, I reached out and you were kind enough to come on board. Kate D'Souza is an award-winning journalist who has changed the way news is covered on Indian television. Her calm research style of hosting prioritizes information over opinion. Faye is a journalist for the millennial young, fresh, and brutally honest. Her belief that more often than not, women are expected to stand up for themselves and the fact that women should support each other resonates very well with all of us at Flow. I would take this opportunity to welcome Professor Yunus, Faye D'Souza, the entire Flow fraternity from Mumbai and the 17 chapters, the ILSS fraternity, Mr. Shivanandan from Roti Bank, and all of you for a scintillating conversation between Professor Yunus and Faye D'Souza. Over to you, Faye. Well, um, after that introduction, I'm, uh, I'm a little lost <laughs> because that was a, a little too kind for me. But uh, I really thank Flo Mumbai for giving me this opportunity to have a conversation at all with someone as illustrious as Professor Yunus. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation. So thank you so much for including me. Uh, Professor Yunus, thank you for being so generous thank with your you. time and uh, being so kind as to agree to give us this time. Uh, I, I don't want to spend too much, uh, you know, take up too much time because I know that there's this fabulous book that you've written and I was reading through it. And um, I couldn't be happier to have this conversation at this time in history, because uh, you have talked about the inequality of capitalism. You've suggested, I think, that capitalism has failed in the job of, uh, you know, of, of equality and uh, 
a world which is zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero net carbon emission is an ideal world, for me at least, and I hope that we can get closer to that at some point. So I want to just hand the, uh, you know, just hand the podium, virtual podium back to you um, to ask you where you believe we are at this point after, through COVID, post-COVID, how much harder is this going to be to be able to remove poverty, to be able to remove unemployment? Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you and talk to your colleagues and to other participants who are listening. Uh, this is a great opportunity to reflect because of the crisis created by Corona uh, catastrophe. This is something that we are all locked down in some way, some, uh, some relaxation probably in some places. But basically uh, the whole world uh, got behind their closed doors for a while. Uh, within 90 days, also about 100 days plus, uh, the beginning of the corona crisis. And this has spread in such a lightning speed. Uh, we had no idea that what's coming. We, we took it lightly, then we saw it's very serious and dead serious. Now we are struggling to go through it. So many dreadful things you can describe. But one thing it has done, uh, as you in the press reported, media reported, uh, all the a very harsh reality of our society, the way we uh, we known this, but ignored it. We never paid attention to it. The enormous uh, struggle that the poor people have to go through for their daily life, how our cities are packed with those uh, unfortunate people uh, struggling to make a living by being the domestics, by being the cleaners, by being the, your uh, selling us things on the street. When the corona came, they were the first victim because they lost their jobs, they lost their income and didn't know what to do with them. And one thing was revealed, millions of those people, as you have shown in our television and we have shown in our television in Bangladesh, heading for home because uh, they cannot survive where they were. And they were making a journey on foot for a thousand mile journey, it's not a short journey. And they had to dare to make a start because they had no other option. And uh, in Bangladesh also same way, the garment factories closed down because of the situation and garment workers get back home. It was a terrible thing. And then have to open it again, this terrible thing to come back with their spreading the diseases along the way. What I'm trying to say that uh, we knew that these people are there but you don't notice them. Suddenly, coronavirus has made them visible, very nakedly visible. It's uh, right in front of us. Uh, it's no longer hidden inside the nooks and crooks of the urban cities. We'll uh, go on the top of the urban life, but underneath, this is what happens. So what is the life left for them? What is that we do in that situation? Many questions arise. Why they have to leave their home? in the first place. Why they had to come to the distances of thousand miles to make a living, leaving their children, leaving their families home. So how to address that, to answer that why, and how to make sure they don't have to. So this is one question that we can discuss. Uh, another thing Corona has done, and I have reflected on it and written about it, that uh, now there's a tremendous amount of efforts uh, you see in uh, discussions everywhere how to get back to quote unquote normal, meaning that where it used to be before those uh, uh, terrible things started happening. Uh, my question is, uh, why are we trying to go back? What are we going back to? Is this the world that is worth going back to? I thought that's a terrible world that we were, and we should be grateful to Corona that they have gave it as a respect, putting the entire machine the economic machine, which created all those terrible things, uh, putting it to sleep. It's in a coma right now. So now you're saying that, why don't you wake him up and start doing it again? I said, no, we were lucky that uh, uh, it gave us this uh, respite from that. It's almost like we, had, we are riding a train, which was taking us to a big disaster. Uh, 
uh, falling off the cliff very soon, but we had no other option because the train is running, we can get off. And the corona came and stopped the train. Now we can get off. And now we are discussing how to get back to the train and start the train to go back again. I said, this is suicidal because that world, that world that we had, uh, I think we lost him, right? Yeah, we're going to try and um, get Professor Yunus back. He was just talking about how we should be grateful for coronavirus uh, for showing us the reality of the world we were living in, a world where a large number of people who are intricately linked to our lives were not really considered with decision making. And I think that became obvious. He said um, it was placed in front of us for all to see that these people could no longer be ignored because we have were forced to look at the ugly truth of society and hence it doesn't make sense then uh, to go back or to undo uh, what coronavirus has taught us. We have to find a better way to live. We have to find a new way to live. Uh, that's the statement he was giving us. But we're just going to take a minute to see if we can get the professor back. Okay. Shabir, can you check, please? Yeah, I'm checking it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Faye, is this, is this a good time? Right. Tell us something about yourself, Faye. <laughs> You're all curious to know. Um, so, uh, are, we, are we hopeful that we can get the professor back? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, in the meantime, I'm maybe sorry. I can... There is a, there is a uh, issue, networking, uh, net issue. So, he lost his connection. I'm, uh, I'm trying to get him back. Okay. Uh, and it, in the meantime, let me just read out some of the comments that are popping up on the chat uh, section. Uh, Barkha Tripathi says, the harsh realities of our society, which we knew but ignored so far, have come to light due to Corona crisis. Precisely, that's what the professor was saying. Poor people started heading home on foot because they could not sustain their livelihood. Why did they have to leave their homes in the first place? Uh, and uh, as a society, we're trying to go back, but is it worth going back to? That's the important question we're facing today. I just want to see if we have any uh, questions. Are there any questions in the, in the chat section? And we'll read out some of those questions while we wait for uh, the professor to be linked back to us. Unfortunately, a lot of what happens these days um, is about... Um, is, is about the internet and our ability to sort of stay connected via technology. So sometimes it works out, sometimes it lets us down. So uh, we're gonna hope and see uh, that we possibly get the professor back. Uh, I was just uh, taking a look at his book, which is available right now. It's a very interesting uh, contrarian insight to um, economics. And that's perhaps uh, you know uh, something that we could all do with reading at this point when the entire sort of trajectory is hit an inflection point. Uh, let me just see if there are any other comments that we can pick up. Uh, 
there are a few questions asking you about what you're doing, Faith. So till <laughs> the list comes in, we'd love to hear you talk about what your new initiatives are. Uh, so, all right. <laughs> so I'm actually in the process of launching my own uh, news uh, startup. Uh, I've turned entrepreneur now over the last couple of months. We would have launched already, except that we got a little uh, sort of slowed down by uh, the lockdown. And so, you know, uh, things are, are a little slower. But the idea is to move on to the internet because I believe that the internet offers more freedom uh, to, um, you know, to journalists at this point than television does. And, you know, I'll just come out and say it. I don't believe the model... Uh, the business model of television news allows for independent or for honest journalism anymore. And you'll see a lot of journalists now leaving television in order to start off on their own. And I'm one of those journalists. So the idea is to use the internet to communicate and to put out information on stories that I believe really do matter, as opposed to uh, putting out stories that are either agenda or the loudest stories of the day. There are several things going on that we should be talking about. And I find that a lot of times, uh, all of the information, all of the communication on a particular story is very adversarial. It's very shouty, it's very angry. Um, but it's time to look at simple communication of information and not opinion. So the, my point here is to go back to just uh, information and uh, to leave out the opinion so that we empower young people to be better voters, better citizens, more informed, as opposed to just being angry, which is what everybody is right now. And I believe that the media plays a very important role in informing citizens to be better voters. And that's part of the democracy that we have to hold up. And uh, as media, we might not have been doing our job very well. So it's time to correct that. Uh, so the company will be launched fairly soon. And uh, the idea will be uh, to have our readers and our viewers support us with subscriptions as opposed to, you know, becoming a purely ad funded organization, thereby, um, you know, we can assure that we are loyal to those people who, um, who pay us at the end of the month, as opposed to what's happening right now, which is basically um, news is a very expensive business. And um, as Fiki and Flo might fully know, uh, you know, we, we were going through a bad patch in the economy even before COVID happened and advertising was drying up. So for businesses that cost uh, hundreds of crores of rupees to run with very little revenue, it puts a lot of pressure on the team. So you're thinning the teams out. People don't have time to actually do research. People don't have time to actually do a decent job on, on the stories that they're doing. And uh, advertising is drying up. Um, unfortunately, the truth right now is that the biggest advertiser in news at this point is the government, state and center. And so if your main meal is coming from government, it's unlikely that you will be someone who criticizes that same government. So, which is why we have a media right now that is, uh, let's say, reluctant of criticism, which is its main job, or reluctant of telling the truth, which is its main job, which is uh, something I hope to um, maybe remedy by um, you know, working with a small organization, the good thing of the internet is that we can keep uh, you know, the teams very small and we don't have the big costs of um, you know, big studios or we don't need satellite and we don't need all of those things. So it's able, we're able to do the news at a far lower cost and hopefully be, be looked after by the people who consume our content. So we don't have to put a hand out in front of anybody else, not the advertisers and certainly not the government. So that's the plan. And um, we'll have a launch fairly soon. I have my fingers crossed that we'll be able to launch fairly soon. I can't really hear you. Yeah, there's a question for you which says, how do you get news, citizen journalists? <laughs> so... Um, in yeah. Okay. So the news that oh. I put out. Uh, <laughs> I think Professor is Technology. Back. Oh, back. Oh, fantastic. Sorry for that. Yeah. Oh, Professor, thank you. We're so thrilled to have you back. Uh, just to just to tell you exactly where you left off. You were talking about how it's perhaps not worth going back to That's society right. yes. the way it was pre-COVID and how pre we should exactly. Oh, one was ahead. the global warming that I was trying to explain, and another one the wealth concentration you referred to. Uh, that's a terrible happening and uh, we were on the verge of explosion and also massive amount of unemployment. 
because of the artificial intelligence is coming in a big way and in a massive way people will be dislodged from their existing work i said that's the kind of world which uh, our teenagers were demonstrating on the streets fridays for future saying uh, accusing their uh, parents and their older generations in the family that you have been extremely irresponsible uh, making this uh, world unlivable for us you had no consideration whatsoever Mm-hmm. that we have to live in this planet and we have no such future left so that's a future they were struggling for and if they don't have the future the teenagers don't have the future what happened to the grandchildren and great grandchildren there's absolutely no way in this so i said is this is the world we want to go back and repeat this and uh, making it uh, expedited to uh, complete the whole process of uh, uh, extinction on this planet so i said there's no reason why we try to go back so that's no going back is the message for us so question is uh, now that uh, the train has stopped uh, corona has given this uh, opportunity let's go some place else uh, let's make a train go some place else a place where there'll be first of all will no no global warming whatsoever and there will not be world concentration we know where to rock we have the address with us but we have to find the path and this is the time when we are sitting home not uh, going to offices as we did before uh, this is the time to decide how to go there and uh, make it possible so this is the message that i was trying to bring out and at the same time i see that uh, uh, all the things that we have done in the past how wrong it was uh, that's what all this problem created we created business for maximization of profit and that's the only thing we learned from economics that the maximization of profit is the way to go i said that's a wrong thing because uh, it's based on a selfish idea of human being uh, the idea of human being uh, described by economist uh, is uh, someone who is uh, self interest driven uh, is pursuing self interest maximizing self interest that's what the human being are for that's what the economic economic man is about i said that's not true that's not the real human being real human being is still of course it has a self interest but it has a enormous collective interest also we are not just self interest driven people so we are not money making robots in this world uh, we are people who always take care of us that's why we created family because so self interested we never think, talk, think about the family we thought about the tribes we talked about nations we talked about the global institutions this came for our common interest but economics don't recognize that i said economics has to recognize both self interest and common interest if we do that then we have to create two kinds of business mm. business for your self interest profit maximization and then you have to create the business for a collective interest and that's what we talk about what we call social business zero personal profit one is a maximization of profit another is zero personal profit and that idea of social business we i said this is the now time in the corona crisis when we are moving into a new direction we have to build those social businesses because we have ignored it we created the wrong world we introduced them no do that happen and we have to redesign the entire financial system and that's a guilty party major guilty party it became a vehicle to uh, suck up all the uh, wealth from the bottom and send it to the top so we have a strange society where uh, 99% of the wealth is in the top in the top few percent few persons not even a percent persons a handful of persons have the 99% percent of the terrible global world and the remaining 99% of the people have less than 1% of the wealth i said what kind of world that is and where what are what are, why do we want to go back so we want to create a world where wealth will not be concentrated world the wealth will be shared by everybody and it's possible and that's what the social business is all about uh, it can be achieved it can be done so these are the things that we have to address now financial institutions have to be redesigned and uh, coming back to my point about the uh, people living home trying uh, sorry living cities going trying to go home these are the people who are um, given by the economists a blanket uh, kind of description or a terminology to describe informal sector you heard it million times informal sector i said to begin with this very wrong perception of the people who belong to this they said this is more than half the working force of the country like india 
So it's such a huge number. It's not a tiny little number. And there's a, a formal labor. So economists always consider this informal sector as uninteresting because nothing is happening here so in formal sector. So they, let, so they have, they have no, not recommended any institutions for them. They have hardly any policies. Government has to take care of them by feeding them. That's the only government, it's a humanitarian work for them. And economists treat this entire belonging to some kind of waiting room. You're waiting to get job, to get to the formal sector. So economists concentrated on the formal sector, how to get them into the formal sector, how to create growth so that the economy kind of, kind of uh, gets uh, busy creating jobs for them so that more people will be in the formal sector and so on. I said, this is completely wrong uh, kind of categorization, categorization. I see it differently. I see the entire what quote unquote informal sector as a micro entrepreneurial sector. These are the people who work for themselves, make a living for themselves, come up with these small ideas uh, and doesn't disturb anybody to make a living because nobody's paying attention. I said, if the moment we see them as micro entrepreneurial sector, the moment we do that, something immediately comes. Who are this? Who are the? Which are the institutions supporting them? None. There is no institution. They are the first layer of victims for the loan shark. You see any type of business you see on the sidewalk, somebody has to give them the money, and they usually go to the loan shark who is walking around on the street giving to them. And if they don't pay the money, they break their leg, they break their head, and that's why they have to pay back an enormous amount of interest they charge. So we have encouraged the thriving sector of loan shark without ever paying attention that why formal financial institutions don't come and do that. And we have done that. That's what the micro credit, that's what the Grameen Bank is all about. Defying all the banking principles. We defied every single norm that they had. They always said, oh, it cannot be, oh, you cannot touch it. It's so important. We said, well, if nothing is happening, so we have to do something. So we started a kind of fun thing to do, but it became serious. With a small thing we in the village now, it became global, uh, became all over Bangladesh, all over India and so on. So India did a lot of things on microfinance, but it's still, I said, it's a small part of the financial system needed in, for the country like India, if you include the informal sector into it. Is, you call it anything, micro, you call it microcredit, you call it the, uh, another kind, you need institutions to be built up for them so that they can go and have re reasonable terms and conditions. And these institutions like the microcredit institutions are built to serve them in a way is convenient for them. So this is the challenge that we have to make during this, uh, redesigning the entire attitude, entire structure of the financial system so that uh, micro entrepreneurial sector can be fully served. And I give the example uh, like uh, labor, formal labor. I said, they're lucky in a way. Uh, they got recognized by the government, by the uh, academics. Uh, the academics don't recognize the informal sector because it's waiting room, uninteresting. But they recognize that formal labor. So they recommended many actions and so on. So out of that came the uh, trade unions, out of that came many agencies to serve the labor. And at the top of it, you have a ministry of labor to look after the labor of the job, who already has some benefit, but on top of it, you have protections of rights and so on. This is wonderful and you need more of that. But my question is, why don't you create institutions for the more than half the uh, working force of the country? Uh, institutions to serve the uh, informal sector or the micro entrepreneurial sector. I said, why don't you create the first, first of all, uh, um, ministry of micro entrepreneurs so that you have a policy, you have institutions, you can go them, find out what the problem is, how to help them so that they can go up the ladder because they got stuck at the bottom. There's no ladder because the loan sharks control that ladder for themselves. So they want to just get the money and throw them inside. Uh, so uh, they never get out. So why don't you build this up? So these are, so these are the question raised. Why people have to leave homes for finding uh, opportunity in the cities? Because the home doesn't have the opportunity. Why don't you create opportunity? Why we have to treat rural economy as an appendix of the urban economy? You know, today economists treat the rural economy as a kind of a labor producing factory. You produce labor and send it to us so that we can use them with the, uh, the hand to mouth wages so that they, we can make money out of them. So this, this is a, again, the wrong conceptualization of that. 
why don't we treat rural economy as an independent economy? It has all the resources. It says urban, why urban centers grew? Because you can give only two reasons. Uh, one is infrastructure, because you have the rivers, you have some roads or something, some uh, con conversion, uh, convergence of a, a system of uh, roads that came so that easy to trade, you came there. So this is the infrastructure, then came electricity, then came other urban facility, rural didn't have that. So you have the infrastructure and uh, uh, financial system, to provide them, banks and everything else. I said, today world has changed. Infrastructure can be built anywhere now. You don't need to go to the city. Today, again, Corona has uh, taught us we can go home, do our business around the world, and we don't have to care for the coming to the office. And many of them are doing that. And uh, with the uh, technology that we have in our hand, you could be anywhere and you can run the business uh, out of anywhere. Because then why don't we create a rural economy as an independent parallel economy? and create institutions to serve the people who are there so that they don't have to leave homes uh, out of them. So this is a kind of challenge that we have to take and redesign all the things. The, the corona gives us an opportunity to see where we went wrong. We went in the wrong in conceptualization of things. We went wrong in, uh, in, in building institutions. We went wrong in uh, de designing policies, uh, this, uh, uh, the way we have done. So th this is the challenge that we have to take and uh, understand that uh, uh, we have to go step by step, make sure uh, before Corona is over, we are ready to uh, launch our thing. So I'll stop here and let you ask the questions. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, like I said, this is an ideal world. We have a lot of questions that have come in for you. Um, my question to you before I ask, okay. so I'm going to in that uh, you know, self-interest manner that you talked about, I'm going to uh, use this platform to ask a few of my questions before we bring in the rest of the, uh, the, the audiences. Do you believe, and you've said several times that the current model of capitalism has failed. In, your, in the first chapter of the book, you talk about your disappointment um, in the first Oxfam research uh, paper that was published and how we got progressively worse from there where it was Initially, it was a small percentage of people in the world who controlled all the money. Now it is, like you said, a few people, individuals who control all the money. Effectively, you believe that this, this measure of capitalism, which is just about more and more and more and more for one individual, has effectively failed. Is there an alternative, though? Um, would we be able to have a world where corporates and individuals capped their profit at a certain point and said, you know, after this, the money should just all go back into society. Uh, does it make sense to have multi-billionaires when we know by research that you only take, after a certain point, the money doesn't matter. It doesn't change the quality of your life. Is, is there an alternative system to the capitalism that we have right now? Uh, that's what I was trying to explain, that uh, we have to redesign it. Capitalism mm -hmm. uh, based on self-interest only. If you can design it, uh, which is more realistic, both, uh, both uh, self-interest, I'm not throwing self-interest out, and uh, uh, collective interest, which is a reality. So I said, give people option. Nobody's forcing you. It's not a government decision that you have to do this. We are saying that give people option. You teach your young children in school. You teach your young ch children in home that when you grow up, uh, my son, my daughter, you have two options. You can grow to be a job seeker. You can get a good job. You can be an executive in a business. You can be um, uh, heading a business entity and uh, get a good uh, uh, retirement benefits, have your home and so on. This is your path as a job seeker. Or you can be an entrepreneur. This is both in you. You have to decide what you want to be, whether you want to be an entrepreneur, whether you want to be a job seeker. Today's school, our education system, our home system and home teaching and so on, does only one thing. You do good in school, get good grades, go to the best school possible and get the best job possible. Yes. And as if job is the ultimate of life. That's not the ultimate of life. Job is not a destiny of human being. That's the point I want to underline. That under the 
thing is what you want to do with your life. That's a number one, not job. So today we're pushing them into job. And I keep repeating, I mentioned in the book also, I said human beings are made of uh, enormous amount of creative capacity. It's almost like endless creative capacity. That's what the human being is all about. And unfortunate thing, economists came up with this idea of job, you have to find a job. And if you don't have the job, you are waiting in the waiting room and it creates a, uh, takes away the capacity of the economy because you're not doing anything. Uh, so you have to move into the formal sector so that you can contribute. You're not contributing anything, now you have to contribute. So see how serious the job is that you have to find a job, otherwise you're harming the economy, harming the economy capacity. Of the As if I'm a, some kind of a robot producer so that I can benefit the economy. I, they're not talking about my life. What is this life for? So I said, that is the purpose we have to show, what we have to discuss in our school, in our education, the purpose of life and give the tools. How do you achieve those purposes? These are the two tools you can approach, the being an entrepreneur or being a job seeker. And I said, this is, a, it's a, it's again, a very damaging concept, the, uh, the concept of working. Because uh, I said, the moment you take a job, you sacrifice your creative power. Because job takes away your creativity. You serve the wishes of somebody else. No matter how generous that person or the institution is, you still serve the institution. Your life is at the disposal of their wishes and desires and so on. Whether you like it or not, it's immaterial. And the more you uh, sacrifice your in identity as an individual, as a creative person, more successfully become in your uh, job. So why should you accept that? A creative person surrendering everything became an empty shell of a human being. I don't think that's a good way of using your life. So these are the things that you have to discuss in our uh, 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 economic theory itself. So fundamentals of the economics has to be changed. That's my point. So this is just one. So economic theory can't, yes, can't purely be based on making money and self-interest. It has to also focus on the collective interest of society. Exactly. Professor, would education play a vital role? Because in countries like India and Bangladesh, the difference in education or the quality of education, because we have, uh, you know, 100% free education for all in India, but the quality differs drastically. And it's the lack of quality in education that then, you know, widens the gap between rich and poor. Should education be at the very basis of this economic, uh, new economic theory that you're talking about? Yeah. So probably when you ask that question, you have in mind education as it exists. Uh, I'm saying education that exists is not good. So even if you get the best school, it doesn't happen. It's not useful. I'm saying education itself has to be challenged because education is the one who is handing over all these ideas. Mm. And you're crushing the people, saying that, you see, many institutions formally kind of brag, take pride that we produce, we, we, we produce job-ready young people. Meaning that as soon as you come out, you get a job. That's a success rate. How many of your graduates got immediate jobs? That's what you pride about. I said, is this the education for your uh, robot making factory? You produce robots and somebody picks it up? You're human being. Instead of job ready young people, you should be saying, I'm creating young people, life ready young people who can take the life, what the life is all about, what they want to do about their life. They understand themselves. Discovering yourself is the best education. What, what, is it, what, is, what is it in me? Exploring my capacity, exploring my possibilities, uh, bringing out my potentials. That's what the education is all about. That's not what it is done. So that education that you're talking about, I'm not in it at all, how good you want to be. I'm talking about how young people discover themselves and say, yes, I know who I am. Yes, I know what I want to be, what I want to do. And that's education, that's it. And all the wrong thinking that we kind of drill into their head about what, what business is. Think about business schools, I'm familiar. I'm sure you have lots of friends in business schools. Uh, what do they teach? They teach young people to work very hard, learn every, all the skills so that you can go, go and join a business so that you make lots of money for the company so that the company owners get very happy with you. 
It's a, you, you are you are the, just uh, soldiers, soldiers to fight their war on behalf of your owners of the company. Is this the life purpose that I and make them one of those uh, as close as we can get of the that few people on the top? And we say, ah, we made it. Why should I make them and then complain that about the wealth concentration? I am the one. I am the soldier who did it for them. If I didn't work for them, they wouldn't have that. I worked for them. That's why they got it. So why should I work for them? And then I see uh, I was mentioning about the uh, entrepreneurs. If you become entrepreneurs, uh, suppose I give a uh, kind of a imaginary situation. Suppose all people became entrepreneurs. Will there be wealth concentration? Hmm. No, because everybody's speaking of their own wealth. And nobody has the advantage of having you to work for me so that I can have the wealth. Imagine if half the people who are ready to go into life decided to become entrepreneurs, another half works. Immediately, wealth concentration will be reduced by a sharp person. Because I'm not, work I'm not working, I'm picking up my own wealth. The marketplace is there, I go and pick up my wealth and compete with you. And I have plenty of room for that. So this is it. It's wealth concentration, again, is a fault of the way that we have designed our concept and fault of the design of the financial institution. Financial institutions will give the facilities to the people who are already have lots of money, not give any facility, anything for the people who don't have any life. If you have one unemployed person uh, in your known circle, uh, and he wants to or she wants to uh, start a business, a uh, crazy idea that he, he or her, he has that I want to start a business. No bank in your city will be interested to talk to her or talk to him because uh, you're, you're nobody. I, I'm busy. I mean, uh, you, where is your collateral? Where, where you have, uh, what, do you, what do you give us to us? As if that's the beginning point. You know, entire macro credit was, was successful because we dismissed the whole idea of collateral. Banking thought cannot be done if you don't take collateral. Yes. Only, uh, only people uh, who are on the street side on the loan shark, they can do without collateral because they have the big uh, stick to hit, hit the head and get the money. But uh, we can't do that. We have to have collateral. I said, no, we don't hit the head of anybody, but we do business without any collateral. In, in fact, there's a question on that very point, if I may, uh, Professor. Dr. Madhu Chanda Dasgupta has said, and I quote, does microcredit really empower women, given that men may take the loan, appropriate the loan and push women into the debt trap? What is your experience in Bangladesh? Oh, first of all, uh, I accept that uh, position, accusation. My answer is, if it is so, I'm just taking this question. If it is so, why don't you design something else instead of just saying that it does so? I'm saying credit is something to be available. I'm not saying Grameen Bank is the only answer. I'm sure there are many more versions of it today, all the technology and so on. Criticizing doesn't solve the problem. You say, oh, it doesn't do it. So we have uh, to come back to Grameen Bank. We have 97% of our women, uh, our borrowers are women. And uh, whether they control the family or their husbands control the family, we are 42 years old now, it's all settled. It's a relationship between the husband and wife. It's a completely changed in the, because she has the bank account. Husband still doesn't have the bank account. She has her own money in the bank account. Forget about everything else. The fact that you have a bank account, the fact that you have fresh money waiting for you in the bank account, even if you're not using it, you are a different person, no matter what. You're not as helpless a person you are. The relationship between husband and wife has to change whether you study it or don't study it, that's up to you. But I'm not talking about the loan. Loan is a separate mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. ah, he grab you. He is her own deposit account. Today, Grameen Bank lends out in Bangladesh. Uh, last year, it lent out about $3 billion worth of money. I mean, bank, uh, the total deposit of the borrowers, not the non-borrowers, total deposit of the borrowers is more than $3 billion. Imagine that. So you look at only the loan part of it. You're not seeing their deposit part of it. How deposit gradually grew. And these women who with absolutely zero cap money in their hand, that's how they start. Nothing. It's the husband decides everything. Gradually, week by week, putting little money and little money. Today, they have more money in 
their own savings account, then the bank has given it to them. And I tell the staff of the bank, I said, look, you keep telling them they are the borrowers. I said, you have to change this word. They are no longer borrowers. They are the lenders. Bank is the borrower because she gave more money to you than you gave her. So the table has changed completely. So you have to see that. And I'm saying, still, I'm not saying it's a perfect institution. If you have a better one, please do that. Well, uh, in India, Professor, we uh, we have this term that we stick to a lot, which is non-performing assets, which are big businesses who have taken money from banks and not given it back. Uh, what is the percentage of non-performing assets for the Grameen Bank on, on your micro loans? Well, Grameen Bank became known not for uh, the name, fancy name, uh, or we give loan to my, uh, women. We became known is amazingly high performance, amazing. Ever since it's born, its performance never fell below 98% recovery. And today we have a um, large operation called Grameen America in the United States. People say it's a crazy idea, you bring it to the United States, but we did with 10 years, 11 years now. Uh, we have nearly uh, 150,000 women in 14 cities now, given out uh, cumulatively over $12 billion. And amazingly, 100%, near 100%, 99%, 99.5% recovery in the, in the country like the United States. And these are the people, these are the people who do not have any um, uh, documents, undocumented people, which uh, President Trump always threatens them to get out of the country because you don't have it. We give them billions of dollars as a loan. And if they say, I don't want to pay you, there's no way you can bring any money back from them, but they pay you back. And that's an ongoing thing. It's not something storytelling of the past. It's a reality of the situation. So it, it, those people who are not familiar with the whole idea of microcredit uh, can have, of course, can have some doubts here and some doubts there. And not only I'm talking about the repayment, repayment is not an issue anymore after all these years. You see, coronavirus has created a situation where their business is gone. This is what I was started telling you that the, their livelihood is threatened, their business is gone, their savings is gone. And all over India, uh, one question people keep asking me, uh, is this the end of microcredit in India? So I give them a big smile. I said, don't worry about that. I said, look, look at Bangladesh. It's a country of floods. We go through flood every other year. Some of the floods in five years, in 10 years, a massive flood where everybody does everything. It's a nationwide flood, it's not a local flood, but local flood is every year. I said, everywhere we have Grameen borrowers. Mm. Their homes are gone because flood water is running over the rooftop. Their animals are gone. Their children are sick and they lost all their uh, assets, whatever business they had. The, their survival out of the uh, flood was the most important thing. And we go through the cycle and every time we come back, we come back again, do this start all over again. We always tell, it's a joke, I said, uh, the, this flood is over, get ready for the next flood. Because it's coming, it's just a matter of time. So, flood and cyclone, it's not only one thing. Again, Bangladesh is a part of the corner of the world where it's all the cyclones are coming here. So you hit this area this year, that area that year, you cover it in your newspaper, see how terrible thing, houses blown away. It's all the poor people's house, homes blown away first and their livelihood is gone for us. And you have to start all over there. I said, Grameen Bank come, bounces back every time. And we say, whatever we have lost, in the next cycle, next cycle, our life must be better than what we got before. That's our commitment. So this is what, and that's what Grameen Bank flourished. When, today, that's not, the corona crisis is a much lesser kind of problem because you have not lost your homes yet. You have not lost your animals yet. You have not lost all, you are threatened by life only which uh, uh, flood threatens all the time. So this is, uh, this is the kind of... Yes, Professor Arup asks, uh, asks you this. He says, rural enterprises could only meet a fraction of the need of rural demand. As many local demand, as the local demand is not big enough for local businesses, which is why migration happens to the cities. So I believe uh -huh. the question he's asking is, can rural businesses be scaled enough uh, to compete uh, economically, yeah, with, sure. with the, uh, that, that's, that's uh, yeah, that's one of the rural area. But I look at the other way. I said, look at a funny thing. Rural areas produce people. They come to the city to work. 
rural areas produce all the agricultural products as their primary products. They send it to the city so that the people who came from the rural area can help process it in the urban area, their own produce, and send them back to sell it to the rural areas. So why? We have our people, we have our own produce. Why do we have to go to the urban center? So I said, you unnecessarily complicated the whole situation. You have your own crops, you have your own thing, you just process it and tell the urban people, guys, we have something interesting for you. Are you going to buy it from us? That's why I said rural areas should be conceived as an independent economy. We made it as an appendix. It's a back, back, back house for us, back stage for us. It's not the front stage. Why? We give you the food to eat. If we don't give the food to eat, you starve. We have the food, we have the primary products, we have the labor force. What are you doing there? It's no, we have the finance. Of course you have the finance because you created the financial institute there. Today, that thing is gone because I can have financial institution back there in every village. That's what the Grameen Bank does. That's what, because these are rural institutions. Today, you don't need one place the way you did before, before the technology. Yeah, go ahead. So is the Grameen Bank staffed with local people at the at the village level? Because otherwise it becomes difficult to have urban people move into, low, into uh, rural areas to work. You know, we uh, very deliberately called it Grameen Bank, meaning village bank. And we made it into a law that this bank shall never work in any urban area. It's still 43 years later, we don't have a single branch or single activity in any urban area of the country. No city, no township, no municipality. We don't work. We work in the rural area. So if the rural kid who lived there, they are the one who running it. They don't have to come to the city for anything. Many of them never see reason for, to come to the city unless they want to see what these city folks are look like. Otherwise they have nothing to do. They have their own career, their own thing, their people and the people that they serve, uh, happens to be known people, they are the area they've grown out of, they went to school here and so on. So because we, we thought it's possible to do that, if you, if you make the urban area possible, uh, sorry, if rural area treated as a, as a separate entity, you design an institution exclusively for the rural area. You are now sending urban banks to do the banking in the rural area because the oh, rural area has to be served. So what do you do? You collect all the deposit from the rural area, bring them to the city to help us to finance the city folks. Why? Who gave you the license to take the money away from us? Why can't you keep this deposit in the rural area and invest in the rural area in processing the food in improving? And today we can export the thing that we produce right there. We have our own brand. And for exporting those processed food that we have made or interesting items that we, we marketing, don't have to send to the urban area, we can directly go to the international market. Why shouldn't we do that? We have, then we have, on another thing we have to do because of the reason that we have to movement of young people to the urban areas is one major reason is education. You have all the schools, colleges, universities located in the urban areas. So our children go there and they don't come back because they get used to the urban life. So I said, why well, didn't you build universities and colleges and you know, business schools and uh, whatever medical college and everything in the rural areas? Because the kids are there, they'll be having a good, healthy, uh, uh, unpolluted air and uh, have the best college possible, best university possible right there. So that they know what this is. They have no, inter they have no reason to look for the opportunity in the urban area because they, it's all here. So it's again, matter of conceptualization. How do you conceive of the relationship between the rural and urban areas? Why people have to leave? This is my question, original question they asked. Why people have to leave their own place where they are born? What makes it a uh, uh, reason to push them to leave their homes? If a, a, a home where they are born, at the same time, uh, when you are grown up, you're leaving your family. You're leaving your children. Professor, and you're alone in some urban, yeah. urban slum. Yeah. Yes. Rama asks this question: Does altruism exist because of capitalism? Uh, and I must remind you, in India, there is a law that says um, you know all companies, all corporates have to put a certain amount of money back into charitable causes in order to get a tax benefit. Does altruism exist because of capitalism? Is it a way of human beings sort of balancing these things out? 
the law that you're referring to was the CSR law that uh, you have to pay, every company has to put 2% of their profit separated for charity. Uh, that's a good law that this you are not paying attention to those people. Law forces you to pay attention to those people. Law comes when it needs to be forced, otherwise you're not doing it or make it convenient for you to do that. So it's a 2% of the money going on. Uh, so that's charity. But the charity is uh, not something that the only law makes it happen. There are many, many institutions in uh, India, charitable institutions, very famous institutions, not tiny ones. There are foundations, there are trusts and so on. And one uh, um, big one uh, to mention is the Tata Trust. Is Jamshadji Trata way back, more than 100 years probably, uh, created this trust. He was a rich man. Why did he give away his money? He didn't give it to his children all the money. He could have given. What he did, he created a Tata Trust and he created Tata Sons separate. The bulk of the money he put in the Tata Trust. So now Tata Trust and Tata Sons have to collaborate with each other to do the things. One is a ch total charitable organization nothing to do with get any, anybody getting any profit out of it. So this is out of its own goodness. So I'm giving the biggest one, the outstanding one globally, but there are many in India. So it's not because somebody is forcing you because you see that you want to do things for people. These are charitable organizations. But here I'm talking about something in the middle. It's neither charitable, it's nor something to, to make money for yourself. It's in the middle, which you do as a business. In charity, you give away, money goes away, you do good things with the money. But uh, what I try to find, uh, kind of point out, when you give away money, your money goes out, does a wonderful thing for the money, but the money doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of our money. But if you had put in, invested this money into a social business, so for healthcare, for water, for financing, microfinancing, or whatever, whatever you thought needs to be done to people, you could have gone and donated it to these people, or you, it's like, like you have a charitable hospital. Uh, you could have a commercial hospital, you want to make money for that. You have a mm -hmm. charitable hospital where you do that because people get treatment. Every year you have to give them fresh money so that they can continue because money doesn't come back. I put another hospital in the middle. I said, this is a social business hospital where you don't make, want to make money. You want to make sure whatever it costs you to serve them, costs come back. So you operate at cost basis. So that it's not as expensive as the uh, commercial ones because they want to make big money. It is not a one-way track with money keeps on flowing out, never comes back. So here you create a round, uh, uh, it's a round, uh, rounded flow. It goes out and comes back. So the same money can be working again and again. So the, say, the social business money has endless life. It never stops. So that's the option I'm giving. So you choose which one you want. Professor uh, Vikas Puri has this question. He says, the majority of the labor now going back to rural areas is a boon in disguise for India. Do you believe you agree with that? And is this an opportunity that can change the face of our economic structure, provided the government takes correct actions? So one of the things, a, a recent story, uh, Professor, was that there are about 15,000 workers coming back to Mumbai on a daily basis. Uh, since people have gone back to the villages, Will it require intervention by government? How do we create opportunities to change, to use this opportunity of change before we go back to where we used to be? Now again, going back to what I already said, uh, say that uh, the reason they have to leave home because there's nothing there. You have not created anything. So we have to first change the theories. Government cannot uh, act uh, in a vacuum because everybody would say, hey, how crazy you are, why are you doing that? So they need a framework and the academics design those frameworks. They are saying that, oh, it's useless to give these people uh, anything in the rural areas. They have to come to the city. City is the place where the work is. Uh, work with the responsibility of the rural areas to produce people and send it to the urban area. Then government will follow that. Government will recognize the, uh, uh, the informal sector as, as a waiting room and try to help them, give them charity, give them uh, some uh, philanthropic money, uh, some subsidies, sending with the Aadhaar, send some cash to people, those kinds of things. The standby, there's nothing permanent solution, just a standby thing, take care of them. I said, why? 
why did, why didn't you recognize them that they are capable people many of them selling uh, stuff in the roadside they're not working for anybody and they have lost their income so they came home so give them the financial facility so that they can start their business if they can start the business back in the wherever they are coming from or they can start the business back where they are in in, 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 the, in the rural areas that you are in so the institutions are there so that my position is uh, we have to change the policies first individual initiative is important but it's very important to have a national policy and so on a policy to create the institution and also academics to redesign the system uh, because that's where your mindsets come if you're told that this is the, your only destiny you have to come and work then you're i'm waiting because uh, uh, I'm an unemployed. If you talk to an unemployed people, why are you not doing anything? Because I didn't have a job. As if not having a job, entitles have to sit there, a capable, uh, creative young person sitting there, not doing anything, saying that I don't have a job. Why don't you do something? You have your hands, your feet, your mind, your eyes, do something. Then they say, where's the money? Give me the money, I'll do anything. No problem. So that's the finance part of it. And used to, tell us that they cannot give money to uh, a person without collateral uh, because they will run away with money. So we have now millions and millions and millions of women showing every day they pay every penny back. And you cover your cost and you continue to expand and that's it. So what is your excuse now? Well, uh, Professor, last question before we run out of time. We haven't spent enough time talking about uh, this, the third part of your three zeros which is zero carbon emissions or zero net carbon emissions. How do we get there? Because uh, in India, at least we've noticed that the government has to come down really hard. We have to have regulations. We have to have implementation of those regulations. And a lot of times there's a lot of cutting of corners when it comes to the environment from government and from corporates. How do we become zero net emissions of carbon? Oh, this is the right question for at this moment, right? because we are talking about not riding back the train to go back to the disaster that we're in. We are out of the train now, train has stopped. We want to have a new train to go to a new destination, uh, different from the old one. When we are getting back to the train, who should allow, who should we allow to get back into the train? That's the question. Uh, like if you are going to the new direction of a, a world, uh, if you are, we are building, we are carrying the old economy, then you will create the old economy all over again. So we have a uh, check post. We have immigration sort of thing. We uh, decide who should get into the new world, who shouldn't get into the new world. The first one will say, if you are involved in the fossil fuel industry, please, you cannot go into the new world unless you throw away your uh, whatever you do. Because, the, because whoever created the problem, you have to stop them. You just talking about global warming doesn't solve anything. Find out who creates it. And if he's creating the problem for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, why should we allow them to go back? I said, this is a good time to ask that question that you cannot go back to your business. So you have to find some something else. If you still want to stay in the energy sector, you be renew, renewable energy. And then we welcome you, give you garland, and you we appreciate you. We uh, uh, have celebrations for you. We do that, but if you are in fossil fuel, sorry, you can't get in. So that if you are in plastic, for example, we'll not let you go in because you are killing us. You kill us, and we you want, you want us to uh, kind of go and applaud for you because you make lots of money. And that's the question you have to ask. Anything which created the problem for us, we have to stop it right now. This is the opportunity to make a checklist: who can go, who cannot go, who can do, who, who cannot do, and the people who are enhancing the uh, cleanliness of the uh, environment, renewable energy, and so on, they will be the champions for the new society. And that's the thing we have to decide. It's a hard decision. Otherwise, you cannot escape from the disaster that we are heading for. Yes. Uh, Professor, I think we've run out of time, but it was such a brilliant okay. conversation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, Thank for, you for, for giving being, the opportunity. Thanks a lot. For being so patient with the questions that we asked as well. No, no, so most, most welcome. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Nice to talk to you. I hope we keep in touch. This is not the end of the all yes. the conversation. This is the beginning of it. We have to do something. It's a, it's not just a having our conversation and go home and forget about it. If, yes. if it if it hits you something, if you have something in mind, anybody can do social business. 
your child, your brother, your sister, or yourself. Absolutely. And make it happen. If you are in a company, create a social business on the side and see who else is doing the social business to find out what's going on in this. Uh, if that is something that uh, can save us. And that's the kind of thing I was explaining in the book that who are doing it, how we can do that. So how to ch change the mind of the young people. The job is not, is not the destiny because we are stuck with the job because we, we, nobody told us that we could do something. But you have, you have the opportunity to decide whether you want to be an entrepreneur. And we have to build those institutions. And if nobody else is building it, you build it yourself. You don't wait for anybody. And that's the capacity of the each individual. We can do things which you want. And you said, uh, can we build a world like uh, with three zero, zero poverty, zero okay. unemployment and so on. Uh, my only question, is, uh, maybe we can come close to it. I said, why come close to it? If you can come close to it, you can get there. So don't shorten your sight. If, if, you can get, if you can get the start of the journey, you know you can get the destination. It's all a question of starting the journey. And we know where our destination is. And that's very clear. If you know the destination, we'll, we'll build up a path. That's how the whole human civilization came to this world. We had an idea, we built a path and got there. Otherwise, it will never happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand Thank this back. You. For... Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Thank you again. Bye bye. One minute. Just one, one minute, uh, Professor. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. You're on mute, Nikita. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Uh, Professor, we'll take advantage of your generosity just a little bit more. We have one last question from Ms. Kiran okay. Vira. Uh, <laughs> Kiran, would you like to ask your question now, please? Go ahead, Kiran. Um, Namaskar, Namaskar, Professor Yunus. This is the second time uh, that you are with Flow Mumbai chapter. Uh, we hosted you in 2007 uh, in wow, Mumbai. Way back. Yeah. Yes. Time to come back. And, uh, delighted to be with you again. I had said then once that you were my hero number one and you continue wow. to be that. Uh, I just did, don't want to ask you a question. I think Faye has done a great job. And I'm just digressing a bit to say, Faye, it's great to see you again as well, along with uh, Professor Yunus. Professor Yunus, I just want to share something with you that uh, about the organization that has hosted this flow, which is the Women Wing of Fiki. Uh, we've collated a database of women entrepreneurs recently, which was spread across its 17 chapters. And these women were the nano, they know MSME or tiny, not nano yeah. business women who were street vendors doing tiny yeah. businesses like selling tea, savories, yeah, vegetables, trinkets, etc. So this sample study shed light on uh, one of the most widespread, hardworking, and yet the most neglected segment of any community in definitely in the Sark region, and definitely in India. Everywhere, everywhere. So we created mm -hmm. um, a, a report which was called Invisible Women, bringing them to the fore, forefront. Yes. It was presented to the government of India. And I'm really happy to report this, that for the first time, the government has taken cognition of this category and in their stimulus packet that has been doled out this time, they have created a 10,000 crore cache of funds for street vendors. But the most is, yeah. we hope that it will reach where it should. But yeah. I want to tell you that, you know, if there can be some cooperation between federations like us, and we can, you know, we can change the policy and we can reach out to the government, which we'll also love listens. We'll love that. Yes. We'll love so that. So I just thought I will not contact. ask you any questions, but tell no, you no. that something thank you. is happening. Thank you for it. Yeah, thank you. We'll be delighted to keep in touch. We are on thank the you. same page. We are in the same page. You're doing for this exactly the same people we are working for. So you are, are it's good that you are uh, being hosted by this organization today. I thought yeah, it would make you happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy that I could talk to you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you, Faye. Great. Thank you so Thank you. much, Professor. It's an absolute privilege having you with us. And Faye, thanks to you. We couldn't have had a better person hosting this conversation. And um, we are so excited. You're building the media that we desperately need in the country right now. <laughs> so all the very best for that. I'd also like to thank uh, Malu Natrajan, Chairperson of Wiki Flow Mumbai, for this collaboration. Uh, thanks, Malu, for all your support. And also all the past presidents of Wiki. 
uh, Vicky Flo and uh, all the attendees who joined us today. Uh, for those of you who enjoyed today's session, please do uh, look us up. Our nine day leadership program is accepting applications right now and we'll be happy to talk you through it. Any information that you need, do reach out. Thank you, have a great evening and goodbye. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Malu. Thank awesome you. session. Thanks. Thank you, Malu. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. 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 <laughs>